What's up, man? How's it going? It's going well. All right. So we're into the full swing of the Christmas shopping season. Are you now? Are you are you done? We're shopping. No. Oh no, I haven't started. Um (laughs) I've I've started, but it's you know, time times are tight. It's things are lean, so we're we're going heavy on gift cards this year. Um and for my wife, you know, one of the things that we're we're doing now, this game of don't buy me anything, because we'll just do something together. Okay, great. Well, I know better than that. But the loophole is okay, I won't buy you something, but I can make you something. So double dip the points for making it and still giving the gift. So I'm constructing something that, you know, you get into something like that and then you realize, oh, like four other tools I need that I don't own to do this. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm doing right now and uh, tearing up my garage. So um, that's May where I'm at with my Christmas adventure at the moment. So. May I ask your garage is being torn up. Is she allowed out there while you're constructing this? Yeah, it's it's early stages. So I feel like in, once we get into the you know more detailed construction, I'll have to hide. And you know, I, I think it'll I think I'll be okay. I'll be able to conceal it. She doesn't pay too much attention to what goes on out there anyway. So I'm just I'm not too worried about it. That's your area, right? That's your area. Yeah. So she's like, yeah. I, I'd like I like to keep it that way. Some sometimes there's some infringement. How about you? I also have not started, uh, but I do have the list of what I should be getting for everybody. So Mm. this weekend, I'm just going to go in typical Matt fashion. Here's my to-do list. Check everything off. All right, I'm done. Instead of, Mm -hmm. oh, I want to go check the sales and that's exciting. It's just like, tell me what I need to get. Boom, 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 boom. I'll do that this weekend and I'll be done. But I always do something like, artsy crafty craftsy creative something for my wife each year that's she doesn't ask for it's just something hey i figured i'd make something i'm not in the garage with a workbench and buying new tools but (laughs) (laughs) but something smaller something simpler something i myself can actually handle you could always write her a song you know and just serenade her i have written her or or she well passed buying into that that's (laughs) that's She says she still likes to hear me play uh, the guitar in the in the living room while I'm just hanging out and she's in there. So it's not annoying her yet. Yeah. Hey, that's good. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, today's topic is one that I would love to be able to say I am shocked and dismayed that this goes on, but um, really not. <laughs> so yeah. Um, today we're going to be talking about corruption this time in academia and what it takes truly to be published and the background into the, I guess I'll call it a game because it is uh, that the, I guess higher ups, I mean, the deciders of who gets published and who benefits publishers, um, the journals, um who stands to benefit and what it really takes so we've done a a little bit of research so matt you've read an article that was pretty compelling about this topic pretty recently right yeah and and actually it's interesting uh because what's happening in washington dc kind of triggered my memory of reading this article that kind of stood out to me we talked about this article a couple months ago actually um and it, it reminded me when you see these university professors that are up in front of Congress and, and they're saying that, you know, the call for genocide is is not necessarily against their their school's university code of conduct policies or whatever those things are called nowadays, whatever is politically correct. Um, but they're, they're going to say, no, it's not against our code of conduct. And then, you know, it's the apology tour now. Well, we, you know, it is against our code of conduct and we don't want this. And and it just it reminded me of this article about how fake a lot of academia and and scholars at a high level are 
So I wasn't surprised either, even though I was kind of surprised, but uh, thinking back, I remember this article, Hey, th this, they're all up there uh, trying to make somebody happy and, and make each other happy and build each other up. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it brings out that question. Is it really about learning? Is it really about education? Is it really about academics or is it about themselves? Just like in any situation, there's corruption. Um, this right, article. Right. Yeah. This, this, and, article, and this isn't new either is, is the thing. This isn't something that's like, Oh, this is just now coming to light because of you know certain topics that are uh or you know research is, is coming out on or is coming out in in certain journals i mean i think we've saw in a few sources that this doesn't limit it to uh the medical field or the engineering field or the business field like this spans every uh academic discipline where uh you know sources i guess sources um are being cited to support research that gets published and it's just a sham <laughs> basically yeah. where anybody can be a source and they're expecting um to get something in return when somebody gets published but who who really loses out on that is like you said when the normal person looks to these scholars uh you know as the authority on a topic and they're so easily um influenced um to just say whatever they want in terms of getting that site that citation in a research paper um to make them authority and prop them up i mean it's to to find somebody doing that if you were in that profession how do you trust any of the information that you're being told to rely on to either do your job, make decisions in your job? I mean, it's especially concerning in medicine, but even in business from an ethical standpoint, or, I mean, it could be any, pick your field. Um, it, it's just like, wow, I can't believe this goes on and it can, it's continuing to go on and it doesn't seem like it's going to go the right direction anytime soon. Yeah. And it, it Let's just go into the article real quick, just before we go any further, because you and I both read it, both really uh, struck a chord with us. I'll just summarize it real quick, so anybody that's uh, listening, and we'll put a link to the article uh, as well in the uh, in the com or the 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 video notes below. Um, so if you want to check it out, read it for yourself. But but basically, the key point of this article from uh, I saw in Nature dot com um, is there's a coercion for citations, basically. Some researchers are pressured, a lot of researchers are pressured by editors to include citations in their manuscripts that are unnecessary, that they weren't using before. And it's not an edit like, hey, why don't you go and look at this person's information and see if it's, it, fit, it fits what you're trying to say. It's, hey, you need to add these citations into in, into your into your journal. And so here's, you know, if we look at that, obviously we think of the motivations, they talk about it. It's, it's they might request additional citations just to boost the journals or their own citation counts. Because once you get into citation counts with scholars and academics, it's like, oh, they've been referenced in this article, this this article, this article. And you know, you see this when somebody gets up to speak and they're like, oh, they're the doctor of philosophy and jurisprudence, da, 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 and they've been in this and this. And that's part of it. It's building up that credential resume to see what they've been. So they also might try uh, when you look at the peer reviewers, which we'll probably talk about, but they'll try to get citations of their own work just to build them themselves up as well, because they're reviewing the manuscript and they're right. going to basically say, hey, it's it's good or not. Um, so yeah, there's, I scratched your back. You scratch mine because right. <laughs> I made you look like an authority on this topic. And now mm -hmm. I need to build up that book of citations basically mm -hmm. to make my research appear more valid. Yeah. And so the, the study was done in 2012, but there's been other studies that you can find that that uh, say this is still ongoing. Um, so here's the crazy thing on acceptance rates. And I'm gonna look at the notes here so I get this right. Researchers who complied fully with their editor's requests had an 85% acceptance rate. Those wow. who complied only partially had a 77% acceptance rate. Those who refused had a 39% acceptance rate. So you can see just based on the numbers of, of whose papers are getting a, a approved and accepted to be published as a scholarly work is 
directly correlated with accepting unnecessary citations from other people and other sources to be added to their work. And so wow. on top of that, there have been found citation rings that involve multiple scholars and journals that agree to excessively cite each other. And so these actually have been found as well in the, in the, in the article talks about this, but this is, and you look at something, an article like this, you're like, eh, whatever, they're just, who cares? It's just the scholars doing scholar thing, but it really does have an impact and uh, to what you're saying and, and whatever industry you're in or, or what have you, you talked about the trust, trust and expertise and trust in, in, those that we should be trusting in because they're the ones that either supposedly have the, the keys to the information they're the ones that's been studying something so they should have an accurate assessment of what reality is and whatever their industry whatever their field is and whatever they're studying they're degrading that trust you know we're seeing colleges get more expensive people coming out of colleges with degrees that they're not really useful um, you know if it's the the humanities or or, or what have you it, it becomes and we've seen this it becomes the big head that comes out of these colleges and these academics just because you know they basically had all these citations and they can prove it. They can be like, look at how many people that are also experts agree with me and cite me, and and it becomes this avalanche. It gets bigger and bigger yeah. as it, but it's rolling up. And this, yeah, and, and the article is just a small part, right? That was twelve thousand responses in the article, but it's but they say there's eighteen different academic disciplines that have these padded citations going on but like you said the the usefulness of the degree that's being pursued well it's that's you, you could also say that's partly the what is the individual really aiming to do with that degree i mean mm -hmm. are they are they you got to assume that they're relying on an income to be produced from them getting that degree but now this kind of illustrates that you could easily pick up on how to play this game, even as a right. student, yeah, as a university student, if you're like, okay, what the, all this, this citations, Oh, all I have to do is, <laughs> it is like become an authority on this, you know, and then get cited in a bunch of research papers in order to like catapult their own careers. You know what I mean? Like you could just repeat that cycle um as a student i mean and that would be pretty smart i think because i mean why not if if you're if you're seeing how easy it can be to uh to advance your career just based on you know this back and forth and uh then then why not but it almost it almost seems like it's just an inside joke with everybody that gets in and agrees to play the game once they're in, it's just like in politics or in anything where there's corruption. Once you're in, you're in, like you're in it. Everybody yep. knows you've participated. Yep. And, and so I, I'm reminded of, cause you and I both went to uh, the same college, Miami. Woohoo. Uh, which, Go oh, Red Hawks. Miss it. Yeah. Aren't they going Matt to the bowl game? Headed to the Cure Bowl, December 16th against Appalachian State. Dang. Never heard of the Cure Bowl. Is that a new one? I, uh, uh, let me check my <laughs> let me let me check the rolodex of bowl games right. that exist now <laughs> it's like 10 more bowls every I year know. oh what were we saying yeah so uh we went to miami we both went to both to school at miami university so we both have kind of had experiences with friends that you know we're still friends with or whatever in different industries or different academic uh, uh directions that they went we all we've had stories and and one of mine that comes to mind is a buddy i had won't we'll mention uh, his name, but he was genius, genius level smart when it came to chemistry. And he was working on uh, developing some sort of new molecular structures. So, and I'm not, I'm going to get this all wrong, uh, but I'm going to dumb it down for everybody else. That's probably like me. He was really smart. He was creating or trying to create new medicines and he, he would get excited. He'd be work, you know, in the, in the, uh, what is it? The lab or whatever it would be all weekend long, come back and, He's like, hey, this is exciting. This is what we're gonna do. We're talking to him and and how he's gonna get it published, how he's gonna get it tied into, you know, trying to get it to a pharmaceutical company or what have you. Long, I'm making a short story long. I should make it the other way around. Basically, what he said was 
in order for him to do this work and to publish it and because he was working on getting it published and, and submitting to pharmaceutical companies however that worked his professor had to be on the document or on the paper or whatever he was writing his professor had to be on it and and i remember asking i was like is your professor doing anything he's like just like any other professor he's providing some guidance and he's checking you know the work but he gets a full share of the credit so here's ryan i'll say his name ryan doing all this work i mean he's just killing it you know in, in college mm -hmm. never saw him wasn't partying wasn't doing anything and his professor is going to get half of the credit now his professor is probably doing this with five six seven different students so it becomes this game right that he was involved in this involved in this involved in this involved so it's in this. intellectual property rights it's basically right. my student right came up with this and the in their perspective is I taught him everything, you know, so of course I should be credited with his discovery and hard work. And, and that makes me think of exactly your point. It's that intellectual property that academics is a business. And as we see in, from at least for what I've seen in academia, if it's, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's very left in general, not, not all, but in general, a lot of, uh, higher education, universities, colleges, campuses, et cetera, lean left. And it's because of academics and um, the, those that are scholarly in nature that have been just professors all their life or in the humanities, which is getting stronger and stronger and stronger in universities, uh, that they lean more to social Marxism or, or, or more of social caring nature but it's that very patriarchal mm -hmm. or matriarchal caring nature, which in essence is still the antithesis of what they're saying. It's still crony capitalism occurring in academia, but they're pushing this, you know, this Marxist level, you know, agenda, I would say out. So you have all these, sure. Sure. and it's always happened. You've seen it. Where do you go? It's in college. That's where the hippies, you know, the hippie movement, the peace movements, not to say any of this is bad, wrong or what have you. It's just, you no, know, but it does could... illustrate the, the fact that just like most things today, there are barriers to getting any credible information out there, even mm -hmm. if it's useful. What if it's the cure for cancer, that this exact same scenario would would have to go through all that red tape and bureaucracy to get to a place where, oh, this information is readily available to the public? Like. It, and it's because somebody stands to make money off of it. I mean, uh, it, it's just like, you know, the guy from GM who came up with the car running on vegetable oil, you know? Yeah. That just seriously went away because oil companies weren't going to be able to make money, you know? So, it, I, I mean, you could, maybe that's an extreme example, but it's like it's got to go through all these channels to make sure proper people are credited and it follows this you know same sort of same old same old um you know structure of information getting pushed through to what's available to the public and it's a yeah, shame it, it is and it should be where it is truly higher education and that's what it's that is strictly what it's about getting people educated and prepare and or preparing them for a career not always is higher education meant to prepare you for a career um, it is to educate which is not necessarily the same as preparing you for a career but it should be about right. one of those two things and i think it's it is more so just like anything i mean we are in a capitalist society but it is more about uh business big business money stature um notoriety and it's that individual once i'm important i need to make sure i'm padding that to maintain my to maintain my status and you add that you know something that in academics that doesn't exist in other businesses unless you're i guess unionized uh, but there's the tenure aspect too so you get that tenure mm -hmm. you right. can still do whatever you want and you have these academics that are insulated from real life most of the time i'm not saying all but a lot are insulated in in real life from what is actually reality unless they're like politicians <laughs> just like the politicians yeah it's it's unless they're actually and there's a few politicians out there that that you know run their actually run their own business and you know actually participates in their community and there's there's some that just stay up there and chat with the business 
people that are, you know, paying into their uh, packs. Yep. Um, but it's the That's academics. Good. It's the academics as well. It's that that academic game, and at a certain levels, it becomes a, a rotating door as well. But my my thing is this: you know, people wonder from different sides of the aisle. Hey, why? Why is why do people believe a certain way? And I'll say this right now: this article is an example of why so many people have lost trust and are continuing to lose trust in expertise you know listen to the experts you see what's everything that's happened in the last three four five years everything with COVID. or i, I don't know if we model can say of that. the pandemic yeah listen everything yeah and then people are like hold on hold on hold on i know i'm not an, well not everybody was saying this i know i'm not an expert but some people were yeah, experts <laughs> but hold on hold on let's you know you're you could be wrong no we're experts trust us two years later well come to find out and and so when when you don't have conversations when you don't talk and discuss and hey let's actually test this idea let's have an open discussion and that's what i'm scared for with academics especially seeing this is hey if there's if i'm writing an article let's say in the political realm political science and i got a professor that is not on the same side of the aisle politically as i would be let's say i write up an article perfect whatever it might is give it give it to the professor um or not even as a student but as as i'm getting my master's doing my thesis trying to get something into a journal give it to my professor the professor nope this is i'm not going to push this at all i'm going to tell hey don't cite him either don't hey you don't want him writing anything don't get involved with this there's well, there's yeah. a, there's a whole because circle they have a hand in funneling you and your worldview into what they think it should be yeah i mean and they i'm sure a lot of professors feel like oh that's like their responsibility to to do and i i that's that's in itself wrong um i mean because now you're stifling somebody's view when they could be coming through with something that no one's ever brought up before talked about before completely new perspective and every college freshman is kind of hot you know going in hey like world's your oyster you're going to be able to bring all these new perspectives you could be the the best in your field and bring all these fresh ideas but i mean reality is some are going to get squashed most probably most it's mm -hmm. it's in a lot of the college is i, I think and I, I say college but we get working with scholars like this it's conform to what we have learned and if it's different from what your parents have taught you because it's you know you got that rebellious side of college it's it's expected and it's also how can you make me look better as it doesn't really seem so much as to be anything really about the students it's how can i make mm -hmm. my career better which goes into i mean that's just that's the nature of the beast right so many people are more it's it's you're looking out for yourself you're never going to see these students again you might not ever have to work with any of these people submitting something for a research journal ever again but mm -hmm. hey if you can piggyback on it or at least get your name on it you know it makes yourself look better and that's a concern sure. it's a huge concern and i think that's you know college has just become you know an expensive ticket to a first interview or uh, uh, an expensive way to find your future spouse. Right. <laughs> right. And, and it's funny that you kind of outlined it that way because I, I tested this in a way in college where I took an unpopular opinion and wrote a paper on it. I mean, that was the assignment um, was to basically here's the topic and you know, basically argue your point on it. Well, I purposefully took the the opposing viewpoint of the professor that the one that I knew the professor would take because it was a very polarizing topic, and I wrote it the way I saw it, and I didn't even get a grade on the paper. I got asked to rewrite it for a grade. So if there was something below F, I'm sure that. Or an incomplete that's probably what I, what I would have got but i had a good professional rapport with this professor and i was given the chance to write it again so i i knew something like that would happen not to that extreme of a case but it did so i rewrote the paper in the exact 
manner that I thought she expected it and her perspective to be A plus when I when I wrote rewrote the paper. So I didn't get to even, I mean, in this, it wasn't it didn't affect anything. I mean, yeah. it, it was just it was on principle purely, but I got to at least prove to myself, like, oh, this does happen. <laughs> but I I mean it, it was just for the grade, but I wouldn't have cared if I didn't get the incomplete because then at least I knew what this instructor was about. Um, for my own personal satisfaction, it wouldn't have helped my GPA. But <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was kind of eye opening to discover yeah. that, hey, all I had to do was give you what you want, and you give me the grade I want. So it, it really cheapens um, the education. I mean, when you know that it you does. I, I have a similar story, actually, and I'll, I'll say it. It was my econ professor, uh, and they were talking about, at that point, uh, defense spending. I think this was uh, uh, macro, right? Macro, and talking about defense spending, government spending, what portion Which of it should that be. That mattered. Yeah. Well, this was back, too. I was in the military, and you know, and I, I, I had a different view back then, but it was still logically based around statistics, data, numbers, everything. And I, I was, I was argumentative with the professor because his points were not, he was discounting points. I thought that should be considered in the discussion around defense spending and why we were so much higher than other nations around the world from my, from, from a perspective of a defense analyst wouldn't, wouldn't hear it. Right. So I was just like, I'm going to write something up and have all the numbers not asked to write this paper. So I wrote this paper and it was, hey, this is this is why. And basically the premise was because of our agreements with NATO, because of our agreements with allies across the world, because we have determined after uh, World War II that we weren't gonna let, I mean, this was basically the premise was we had the Navy around the world. We we're gonna prevent pirates from, you know, preventing trade. So no one had to worry about sending protection with their boats to make sure that they weren't taken over by another government, taken over by another state. So all that stuff happened before. That's why everybody had navies was to protect their com commerce. Right. But after World War II, it was okay. Everybody else is blown up, can't do anything, but people are still going to, the United States is just going to make sure we're going to police. We might not be the police officers of the world, but we are the police officers officers of the world's trade and commerce. We will make sure people can safely trade across the oceans. So that's that was my premise. It was the reason that we have so much money is because we spend so much money. Now, looking back, I may not have been exactly right, but I don't think I was exactly wrong either. But I give mm -hmm. this paper to him, not for a grade, not for anything. I go in one morning to class and everybody's there and he's waiting. And he's like, all right, everybody's here. He said, okay, so, Matt here decided to write up a paper uh, about why we're da, 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 spinning. He's like, and I just, you know, I'm going to tell you why you're wrong. And this was exactly his words. He's very blunt. I want to tell you why you're wrong. And he gets up on the board and writes up a number. He said, when you did your math, your decimal should have been right here. He said, and all of your math is totally wrong now. And I'm like, what? So he, in front of that, like this was in front of it. He had to get in front of class. Like it was the weirdest thing. And I was not that argumentative like that. I had gone to his office hours. Like I'm asking questions. What do you yeah. think about this? What do you? Well, yeah. But it My was. It, the floor is not in right. front of the whole class. In front of the class, he did this, and I'm like, oh, "All right, I know I was up. I know I was up late last night." <laughs> <laughs> and I go back and change it, and the and the change was negligible. It, it he just went and said, "You're going to say, did, did it really impact the result or the points no. you were trying to make? I mean, did, did that? But the, no. But the point wasn't. It was, you're wrong. You can't do math. I'm going to tell all the class. So anytime you have a disagreement, they'll know you're stupid. Like that was the idea, right? And here's a professor who should be teaching, mm -hmm. right? And his, his point. So it's, it's funny. You had an experience with the professor, like, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, you see it now. And, and I, you know, as you get older and you read more information about that and you say, oh yeah, there's a reason some of these people are there. Yes, they're smart, but yes, they continue to play a game to where they make uh, everybody they're, else they're there to do their own research mm -hmm. like you mm -hmm. said they're there to, to support their own careers get published or continue to be published um do their research become an authority and teaching is just a side gig i mean like part of it 
yeah. you know, the, if the university is, is saying, oh, yeah, you got to teach this many courses, but you can do your research. And, you know, if, if it's science, like, yeah, you can have access to our labs or access to whatever resources the university wants to allow them to have. Like, that's what they're really there to do. Teaching is the afterthought. I mean, I, not for all of them, but I, you could definitely tell the ones that aren't that passionate about the teaching side of it. Yeah, it's it's an ego trip for sure. And I and I I listen to a lot of stuff on like history, archaeology, religious studies, all, all that stuff, just in YouTube or or whatever. And and it's interesting because you'll hear these acad like these scholars, these professors that you know they've written books or whatever, and they go at each other. Like they call each other stupid. There's no way anybody could. And you know they're not in the same group, right? Like there, there's, I guess mm -hmm. there's clicks in these <laughs> in these uh, uh, areas of of study, but they go after each other, like to the point of saying anybody who thinks the way you do shouldn't have a degree, shouldn't be in, and it's it's ridiculous that you know going back to this, it's it's sad because we should never be certain about anything, especially as we're learning. We should always be testing. I mean, that's the whole scientific method and you should apply that. I think with school, you should apply that to everything. I have a hypothesis. I'm going to test it. All right. Mm -hmm. This is this is the most likely case based upon my testing and hypothesis. You might have a different yeah. opinion. Yeah. Well, the academic world has their own set of problems now. And like you mentioned, speaking of going after each other, the whole Israel and Hamas uh, or, you know, pro-Palestine protests that are going on. Um, so <laughs> it seemed like when that first started and we're, you know, a few weeks now into really seeing headlines about that, but um, that it was, you know, Israel's our ally. There's no way we're going to tolerate that. Well, it seems to have <laughs> shifted the other way, but now how do you, as a university and leadership at a university take a stance on is it okay to bash one side or the other when it comes to that because you know what message do you want to send your students because they have a stance on everything else i mean with covid i mean there was a clear stance like anything that comes at the academic world now they are forced to take a stance on and then by doing that, you're going to alienate some group and some group is going to feel disenfranchised or, you know, whatever. And then that's going to blow back on the university, but they'll try to squash it. So with this, it's like, all right, well, now you have two <laughs> really passionate groups about what's gone on. Um, but, you know, how do you... Um, I guess make the academic make the uh, student body feel like, hey, what's going on thousands of miles? You know, it still matters here, and you know, so like, what are you making of all of that, Matt? So I have a theory on on this. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I have a theory on this. I think it starts with the idea of of social Marxists. All right, now, now this kind of might come out as a conspiracy theorist so and maybe you need my tinfoil on my hat. But in, in the thirties and the forties, there was a mass exodus of in academia from, from Europe uh, that was running from uh, Nazism because communists, they were going after anybody who was communist, the Nazis in Germany. And, and as that spread to a lot of those that were, I would say, thinkers, academics, and those different, the German and Austrian schools, everything like that, if you look at that, they, they were trying to get out. And they brought with them the, a lot of these academics that came and were welcomed into the American ac halls of uh, academia, if I should say that right. They brought with them a left, a very left-leaning uh, ideology. Now, this is something that's coming from Europe and how Europe uh, economic system had come out from feudalism, from the monarchies and, and et cetera. You have that social Marxism because boom, the industrial revolution hit and crony capitalism existed. There wasn't good regulation. And of course that's going to happen. You saw the revolution in, in the soap with well, Russia and, and those satellite states, but so many moved and it changed the fabric of academia in the united states that those those started the 40s and the 50s and that's as well documented i mean it, it, you had the red scare in the in the 50s uh, 
a reason why the Cincinnati Reds were not called the Cincinnati Reds for one year. They changed their name. That's right. Yeah. Because the Reds was a derogatory, like a you know, right. a bad word. And um, so they changed the also name. Also a great movie, year. Warren Beatty. Yeah. So <laughs> so it, this is all well documented that there was a there was a change. And and you saw a lot of that that was it wasn't anti-American, but it was anti individualism in a way that was you are an individual so long as you conform to the group and you saw that with the the hippie ideology right and this is with any any group it's i remember seeing an old john stewart thing where they went to a daily show where they went to the democratic national Guard. and this was back in 2004 2005 this was a while while ago i remember it they go hey we're accepting of everybody we're accepting of everybody and they're jokingly saying but what if they're Republican? Well, not if you're Republican, right? We don't accept you. So it, it doesn't matter if you say we accept everyone. Nobody accepts everyone. They accept you if you think the same way that they do. It's tribalism. It, it occurs. It's hey, same yeah. team. But but that's what happened, I think, in academia. So you have the social Marxism be, became more influential in the United States through colleges. And they had a significant impact in the, the humanities and in the law. Uh, specifically. And so you start seeing a big change in um, the legal dynamic, or I would say the legal dynamic, the legal framework. You also started seeing it in government to where it wasn't like classical Democrat, classical liberalism, classical Republican kind of ideology. You start seeing a, a, a big push on the left towards more of the social European Marxism style of thought. And a lot of that started because of the academics that were teaching these people. And then they were teaching and it grew. And, and social Marxism, Marxism entirely is an academic, and entirely just a bunch of people that are professors that decided, and you look at what happened with Lenin, like they're, they thought that they could run a country. The reality is, Marx even said this, is a lot of people have to die for this to work because you can't have people that are opposed to this for this to work. Mm -hmm. But the idea is it's, it's this utopia. If you just follow me, there's a utopia. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's happened. You have the social Marxist. Now here's saying along, but here's where it comes down to you go to the California, California specifically, they have told um, the, the politicians very liberal, I would say, no, not liberal, but more social Marxist leaning have told any company that is going to, that they will invest in, in their pensions have to follow certain protocols. You know, that's where you get the D, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, those protocols, everything like that. You have to, and any company that we invest in with our pension has to have X, Y, Z. So you have politicians that are telling uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, all these companies, hey, you have to do what we say. These companies have to have this and conform to our social justice programs or et cetera that we want because they, it's academic and they're academics that are now politicians and the politicians are telling the businesses, if you let us invest the taxpayers money in your companies, you have to follow us. Well, California is the biggest pension, individual pension, I believe in the world outside of the federal pension. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of power. So now you have all these companies that have to start and you know, that's where the issues with BlackRock and all them, they yeah. may agree with it, but they're just, they're just trying to get money from the state and of California. BlackRock is so now then, telling people you're not going to own anything and love it. Right. So <laughs> now you so now you have everything in the system is hey it's the social justice social justice because that's the idea. And in the United States you have two opposing beliefs that exist on the left side. One of them is the what happened in 19, uh, 2020, I should say, 2020 with the riots, the Black Lives Matter. And I'm not necessarily talking about the movement, but let me say specifically the organization. And the Black Lives Matter organization, there are a lot of ties with the Palestinian movements, the Free Palestine, CARE, all, all of those as well. But those are diametrically, diametrically opposed to the classic Democrat stalwarts that are Jewish. And, and, really are pro-Israel, pro-Israel support, pro-Israel funding, but they're also, they've been catering to a group that is pro-Palestine and not, not necessarily pro-Palestine, but pro-violent rebellion against Israel. And so you have, and you'll see this, I think a lot of these, these professors, these, uh, I would say these, these academics, these presidents of universities, I don't think they know what to do because on one hand, <laughs> 
on one hand, they're saying these are the same groups, these are the same ones that we've been working with, and they're the ones that are that have been paying us, or or the politicians that are, you know what I'm saying. It's there's this confusion, yeah. and they've let this happen, and now they're losing all the all this money. They're saying, oh wait, part of our core demographic that we're supposed to be working towards is a Jewish tradition, or or supporting the Jewish uh, state in Israel, and so now I think they don't know what to do because they're sitting and straddling a fence to where they're supporting kind of the, the, you know, the classic where the, a lot, a big percentage of Jew, American Jewish population has voted predominantly Democrat. And then you also have this other group that are, they have supported on the Democrat side of, Hey, free Palestine. And, and, and now you have the radical left who believe that anytime that there is injustice in the world, any means necessary are approved to counter that justice. So when you have right. when you have violent, uh, the violent revolutionary types that are believing that pal that that Gaza or West Bank or whatever are are oppressed or apartheid or what have you, I'm not I'm you know not making a comment about that, but making a more comment. That's what they think. So they think any sort of violence and any sort of genocide or any sort of anything is approved. I mean, you got people that are LG, you know trans trans or queer or or gay and you see there's oh you know queer for palestine and it's like you don't you would be dead in a day if you went there especially <laughs> if you were holding that sign up i support you you would be dead well, right right but it, the idea is it's it's anti there's an idea in that that left it's academic that is anti-colonialism anti-capitalism anti the power and in their mind israel is the power and so you must topple the power anytime there's a power dynamic that must be toppled and right, i think that's, that's what it is social injustice they're seeing that as it's a social injustice and they're against any perceived form of, of social injustice so uh, yeah i i see what you're saying there but yeah that makes a sticky situation here um trying to figure out where funding and support financial support gets funneled but that's the danger i think in academia to when you're not addressing hey this is this is what should be happening this is what's effective this is what has happened and instead of going through these power hierarchies and saying you know it's everything's wrong in the world it's how do you how do you make it better for the most people how do you how do you make how do you as an individual and I know that's not necessarily the case with 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 colleges, but that that should be the idea. How do we make? How do we lift? Uh, what is it? I'm gonna have to cut a lot of this. A <laughs> rising tide lifts all ships. Right, right. How do we rise the tide? You know, and if we're looking to pick people apart because of social justice, and you look and say, "Hey, this is this is how I have made a name for myself. This is how I've got notoriety," and we're not letting anybody who has a differing viewpoint come in and or participate. Or if you don't agree with me, to all the point, you can't talk. And then all of a sudden, you have what's happening in colleges right now, where nobody could come and say, "Hey, hold on, pump the brakes. You got to have some differing points of view in here because right now you're you're going to be butting heads in a minute." Universities aren't really. Um places of learning or teaching they're more of instruction is how i would put it because the instruction is going to be specific and targeted with an agenda at you not that it's a you know place of free-flowing ideas and you can bounce all your ideas freely off even your classmates anymore i mean there's there's got to be a a polarizing effect within every institution now and it's just the most clear in uh the universities and academia now it is and i just think it's interesting with all of everything that's happening I, i'm reminded of this article to where it kind of stirs it up it's we expect our professors in society you know when we see a professor or a doctorate or something we automatically assign a value to that without knowing necessarily yeah i'm sure i'm, I'm sure they, they worked hard i'm sure there were late nights and i'm sure they earned their degree but so much of it that also goes into it that's just it's just muddy in the waters it's it's and it's yeah. it's creating distrust it's creating confusion in our campuses it's 
while college is getting and university is getting more expensive, the value that you get out of it is less going into the job market. So do there's think, not. Do you think that's going to hurt enrollments in the coming years? I mean, I think that with all this stuff being exposed, I mean, do you think that? I know that's tangent, but you got to think now with so much emphasis on, you know, trying to, you know, rekindle how popular the trades are as far as like, Hey, this is a career path you should pursue. People need the trades uh, versus your alternative of the college or the military route or like any alternative to the traditional college experience. Um, I think that you're, you're going to see these enrollments just plummet in the next few years. I, I agree. And, and I think, I don't think uh, enrollment for women will will drop. I might be wrong, but I don't think women enrollment will drop, but I think male, I should say female, female enrollment won't drop, but I think male enrollment will. Mm -hmm. So we'll probably have fewer college educated males as a proportion to their population in the United States in the future. Mm -hmm. Because what of that, about, well, I mean, this now that I'm down the rabbit hole, I'll ask another question. So in terms of standards, academic standards, getting into universities. Now, with all the disruption to the traditional education system, you know, that you had, you know, for your K through 12 education experience, um, you know, with standards, you know, dropping or being fudged. I mean, here, at least like here in the Arizona, now I don't know this, I don't have a kid in schools, but you hear people like your neighbors talking about, well, they're just passing kids through when, you know, they would have by pre COVID standards failed <laughs> and they're just passing them through anyway, because it's just, and just, just get them through, just get them through. So like, is that eventually going to create like new standards or are standards just going to go away completely? I mean, do you, are universities going to even, care about academic standards if they're getting money someone's gonna pay the tuition um i get the, the, do they really care i would think if, if from the business standpoint of the university like why not Let it, them in. It, it's that's that's a great question I, I these universities are either going to go out of business or they're going to figure out some sort of way to make sure that the enrollments keep going so they can get, keep getting paid yeah. I mean, and, and who wants to go out of business? Well, true. Oh, and, and they're already, and, and face it, the university should be going out of business. A lot of them should, they, they got, they are subsidized so much. And in essence, you see how much that this, the college tuition has been forgiven uh, for, for borrowers that haven't been able to pay it back. That right there is a direct subsidy to the universities. Now I know people say it's a subsidy to the students. I think it's a subsidy to the universities. The universities have failed these students. They should get their money back from the university. They they said, oh, XYZ, 90% job, whatever it is, 90% replacement into a job or yeah. you'll be making, they failed. And, and, and now they promised something. They were paid money. And now these borrowers are not able to get you know their investment back and the government is paying this off and it's a huge huge subsidy to these universities that should be responsible for paying uh, these loans off themselves because mm -hmm. this is the whole point is is it becomes more about hey it's our notoriety it's our fame it's oh where did you go to school where did you oh i went to harvard you know it's like everyone's like oh it must be smart <laughs> so it's it's all about hey how can we get other people to think that i'm awesome Mm -hmm. and and smart it's, and you should respect that tribalism me. it's that tribalism and then they circle up we got to make a lot of money while we're doing this it's a lot of power mm -hmm. i've got to have the notoriety hey i'll i'll definitely publish this we'll get it published through you know our our uh, harvard book review or harvard whatever their their publishing mm -hmm. arm is we'll get it published but make sure my name's in there make sure my name's in there and then and then you have corruption and when you have corruption everybody everybody that is corrupted no longer is looking out for what's best for their end user. They're looking out for themselves because once, if they get caught, they're done. 
So they got to mm-hmm. keep playing. And yep. it's almost the equivalent of what you mentioned last time about Matt Gates calling out <laughs> on, the, on the floor, calling out um, his brethren for um, playing the game, basically. And it's like nobody wants to, you know, expose and blow the lid off the whole thing or else everyone goes down, right? They all have to continue to keep it up because, you know, if it gets exposed, then they all go down. So, yeah, I, I like, uh, I, I like, and we think, Hey, how do, how do we solve this? Well, first off, I think you have to redo our education system from the ground up. That's, that's not easy. I'm not going to get that, but you have to redo it from the ground up. Our, our education system, is embarrassing for the capabilities that we do have to provide the best education in the world the means Mm -hmm. to do it the funding to do it the tools to do it and our education system just isn't where it should be um and i don't think tweaks are going to change it um right i I think it's got to be because there's money to be made and Mm -hmm. it's education is big business and it is as we see now, it's absolutely corruptible. So you're right; it does have to change from the ground up. But what what does that look like, or what would it take? I mean, it would. That, I mean, that would take decades to actually. I, it would. Pull but it's gener- generational. But I I think that one of the most important things you can do for certain industries or certain, let's say look at Congress and in government, for example, there should be term limits. I mean no one in their right mind could honestly say yeah the chance to be corrupted and stay in power and desire to stay in power would was not going to be as strong as as you know that if we give somebody that opportunity they're never going to take it like they're always going to take it. there's gonna be one percent that won't so you why always can have i yeah well why can i run for a political office at 40 years of age which i am but the U.S. military won't take me any branch at 40 years of age walking in. Why is that? I can serve my country through political office and political service, but I can't through military service. Like, why is That's, there a limit? I'm, there, it's a limit put on me. Um, what if I could, you know, blow most 20 year olds out of the water in a physical test then and, and you still wouldn't take me because of my age? But you can be 82 years old and be president of the United States. So, yeah, so I'll say for the, for the military specifically, it's just numbers. You, you, the, the younger you are, the more likely you are to. Be well, able, right. It, yeah. It's statistics. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying this as okay, there's a lot of old people that should be. Out. It's not a, yeah. There, why isn't there more focus on, on that? Just by comparison, right? It's Who, who's going to vote on term limits. The people who right. don't want term limits and so there's right. not going to be term limits but there should They'll be never. term limits and i say that there should be something similar in university and college now i know there's tenure but there should be something to limit and get these people out of their stuffy office chairs mm-hmm. so I, I i would i would say that there should be and i i'm you know me i, I am no socialist but i'm also not a, just a full-fledged free market capitalist in any stretch of the imagination there has to be good regulation to make sure that people that people who can are not able to take advantage of the system to better themselves at the expense of others now i get it if you're bringing you know, it but if you're taking away something from somebody and their ability to better themselves just so you can that has to be removed right. so i say that from co- universities has such an important part in our society, in our industries, in our infrastructures, in our businesses, such an important part. We have to look and say, there has to be limits, term limits, to how much these people cannot be in the field that they're actually teaching about. If you're going to be teaching about something, you should require X amount of time in a particular field, actually, and somehow qualify that, and also quantify what that means. And say, hey, you can't you can't be in an office teaching for more than four years in a row or six years in a row or, or something like that. Or you have to go to a different college. So there's there's I think enough out there ideas that could work to limit, you know, hey, pad my 
pad my resume for me and and to eliminate some of this corruption. Mm -hmm. I think with artificial intelligence, win. that would be a win-win. I mean, yeah. like the individual gets to do something that actually benefits their career right. while the institution wins by not having a risk of corruption or you know somebody you're also giving somebody else an opportunity so and, and you can continue to further your expertise right so if you're going to look at some you're going to do the hard work do it in the field and if that means hey we'll give you funding for your research for two or three years and then you can come back and teach but hey there you've got to come back with results and make it a result oriented uh, structure and i mm -hmm. get that can be a problem too because there is there is a benefit to omnidirectional research and that might not be the right word but meaning hey this is my hypothesis i'm going to test this hypothesis sometimes you just mm -hmm. have to go and explore so but there has to be some way to quantify or qualify hey what 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 is considered working in your field for a certain amount of time but i think there's a lot of smart people come with ideas you just got to stop people from saying they're an expert just because they're an expert Mm -hmm. right it's it's the celebrity i'm Just famous they want to get cited in papers yeah. i'm famous <laughs> because i'm famous right it's the same right. thing yeah you're an expert mm -hmm. because you're an expert and because you're an expert people are going to try to quote you and you're going to tell them to quote you which means it increases your expert you know and you're going to get everybody else to play your game and now you have a ring of experts like a kardashian that, right and now you're all <laughs> experts and you all agree with each other and you're all on the same page and there's no diversity of thought and that's the problem agreed and a solution yeah but it's good we just have to look and say hey the next generation we got to make sure we're, we're we're telling them when they go into making decisions is school we got to make sure the next generation can read man <laughs> like <laughs> so like i don't yeah. know I, I i caught a little bit of this and that i overheard because my wife works for a canadian company but in canada right now their teachers are striking and so they've already said, and it's been going on for several weeks, nobody's going back to school until after first of the year. I don't even know if they're close to a solution of how they get teachers back, but they're basically back in pandemic mode where kids are at home and you have all these people working from home while their kids are, <laughs> are there. But all the while, the kids are losing out because they're not getting education because you have parents at home trying to work. So it's like okay well how close are we to that like state by state i know that can vary here but like there's a real risk of that happening worldwide again so yeah and it's yeah. it's irritating i i, I remember my I, i'm gonna i gotta watch it was a family member uh, um that i got into a, a little bit of a debate with a friendly family debate oh well, she, yeah he is a teacher now this would have this would have been 15 years ago but she was complaining about oh p teachers don't get paid they go to school for this amount of time or whatever and they get and i get it like i'm not saying that you're wrong that's not my point but you knew before you decided to go to college you knew teachers don't get paid shit. Mm -hmm. and now you went to college and you spent all that money and now you're getting paid shit and you're complaining about it and to me i don't understand that either i don't understand that concept if you have information make a good decision based upon that information and afterward that information still gonna last but it's funny you have these people striking you know you know pay is going to be bad mm -hmm. and yeah yeah shouldn't come as a shock i don't know what the <laughs> answer i don't know what the answer is but it's yeah you you should have chosen yeah. some, if it was about the money you should have chose something different it it's it's i think passion versus practicality yeah. it, and that's what college does to the 18 year old mind is yeah. because you think oh this, I, this, is, just, this is what i want to study and i'm and you're all in and you're fired up about it and then you go in and then you start to see what it really is and then you know it, it changes everything i mean i changed my major like three times that's because yeah you you have to listen to the practical side of it too especially when you're the one paying the bill 
Yeah, I don't I, I don't want to turn if there's any teachers that watch or listen to this, I don't want to turn any teachers off to this. What all <laughs> I get it that teachers don't get paid very well. And I get it, inflation is through the that roof. shouldn't be the I, case either. I mean and that shouldn't be the case. Right. But deserve to be making more. I, I'm of the I'm of the fan or I'm the opinion that any government or fixed type salary thing that's coming from the government, public servers, anything like that even minimum wage, which this is a whole different conversation, but I think all of those should be pegged to the inflation rate. That way, this is what it is. It's never gonna change. The dollar is going to, or whatever your currency is, is always gonna be the same purchasing power. So you can never strike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can, it is illegal to strike. You know what you're gonna get paid and what that's gonna mm -hmm. be, and you will get paid more based upon inflation. But at your levels, you know, it's it's always gonna be the same purchasing power. And that's what I think we have to get to, like with the minimum wage. I'm We're going off on other tangents, but with the minimum wage, mm -hmm. like why, if we have a reason to have a minimum wage, let's say we do, and the minimum wage was $10 an hour 10 years ago, well, why hasn't it adjusted to the inflation rate every single year so that the minimum wage still does exactly what the minimum wage is supposed to do every single year? Every business can plan for their labor costs. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that they're still going to be able to buy their tube of toothpaste, their toothbrush, pay for their rent or whatever they have to pay for. They're going to be able to pay for that. If you tie everything to inflation, then mm -hmm. it removes. But goes into why do we have inflation to begin with if you want to disagree on issues that's fine and nikki and i disagree on some issues but i'll tell you this i've known her for 12 years which is longer than he's even started to vote in a republican primary <laughs> and while we disagree about some issues and we disagree about who should be president of the united states what we don't disagree on is this is a smart accomplished woman you should stop insulting so her. i want to take this I'm going to take several times over so first of all, I think we just learned something from Chris Christie. We hold learned on, three things. Let, we ahead. learned three things right there. First of all, Chris Christie also doesn't know what provinces in eastern Ukraine he actually wants us to fight for. Chris, your version of foreign policy experience was closing a bridge from New Jersey to New York. Yeah. So do everybody a favor, just walk yourself off that stage, enjoy a nice meal, yeah. and get the hell out of this yeah, race. Let, let when it comes to Nikki, I think if you're gonna actually send your sons and daughters while, to go die in somebody else's voting, war, while you, you better, voting, excuse me, Chris, I'm speaking, and I'm not done yet. I you had your chance, time when you and we're gonna be done. So listen up to this, is if these people wanna send your sons and daughters to go die in Ukraine, they've been arguing for it for a year. $200 billion of our taxpayer money sent over, neither of them could even name for you the provinces that they actually want to protect. And this is the people who have been touting their so-called foreign policy experience. It is intellectual fraud. These people are lying to you, the same people who told you about weapons and mass destruction in Iraq to justify that invasion, didn't know the first thing about it, yet they sent thousands of our sons and daughters to go die. The same people who told you the same in Afghanistan, where the Taliban is still in charge 20 years later. Seven trillion of our national debt due to these toxic neocons. You can put lipstick on a Dick Cheney, it is still a fascist neocon. Thank